All right, well, thank you. And um, I am so pleased to welcome uh, Under Secretary for Domestic Finance, Nellie Lang, to the Forum Summit. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for having me. Um, let me do a brief introduction. Um, Under Secretary Lang was confirmed on July 15th, uh, 2021, so about a year ago. Uh, prior to serving at the Treasury, as most of you know, uh, Nellie was a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution. She was also a visiting scholar at uh, the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets Department, lecturer at the Yale School of Management, and a member of the Congressional Budget Office's panel of economic advisors. For over three decades, Nellie served as the, at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, including as the first director of the Division of Financial Stability from 2010 to 2017. In that position, she oversaw the development of financial stability poli policies related to risks in financial firms and financial markets and the interna interactions of uh, financial policies with monetary policy. Her recent research is focused on the financial system and macroeconomic growth. Under Secretary Lane received a PhD in economics from the University of Maryland and a BA in economics from the University of Notre Dame. And we welcome her and, and, um, and look forward to a lot of perspectives on a lot of things because it's a busy time at the Treasury. We appreciate that. It's always a busy time at the Treasury. Uh, someone just walked in and said, are you having fun? And, <laughs> And she, of course, said, "Yes, I'm having you know, great fun." But, but we all know there's a there there is there is there is never a shortage of issues and challenges at the Treasury. So, um, with that, let me um, let me get started by just taking a a, a broad uh, approach um, and, and get your broad view on uh, where we are with the banking sector today. And you you know, you come at this question. Uh, uniquely because you advised uh, the board during your time there um, at, at periods uh, when things were relatively benign uh, and then when things were incredibly stressed. So pre and post crisis and the implementation of the reforms and then, and then the focus on um, financial stability and trying to monitor, examine think about additional risks, mitigating those risks. And, we, and as we've talked about in our first two panels, you know, those, those risks were um, you know, at, you know, clear and um, uh, acute with respect to the banking sector. Uh, they, are, they are now uh, emanating, have emanated, and now more, more profoundly emanating in the non-bank sector uh, on, on a variety of different levels. You've had the responsibility from, from the prudential regulator and the macroeconomic uh, perspective and monetary policy perspective at the Fed, and now you're designing financial policy on the part of the president and the treasury secretary in this administration. Uh, different, different vantage points, uh, different pressures and uh, inputs. Give us a sense of uh, how you assess the health of the banking si system right now um, where, where, you, where you think uh, the banking system is strong? What are the broad challenges that you think are ahead? Okay, well, thank you. First, let me just say thank you for inviting me to be here today. So it's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure to see everyone, many familiar faces and many who I've worked with over the years and currently working on many issues with. So appreciate all the inputs we're getting and um, insights. <laughs> Um, so let me say something about the banking sector and the financial sector more broadly. Um, I think we've had uh, an opportunity to observe in practice, in real, real world stress tests, how the banking sector has done. So we just had an unexpected pandemic, an unexpected onset of a war, an invasion. Um, we've had, we're in the midst of an ongoing shift in monetary policy globally as central banks try to address inflation. These are all risks. I mean, maybe we're having increasingly climate risk events. So there's a number of shocks out there that are hitting the financial system all at once. I would say um, amidst all this, the banks have looked pretty resilient. And I think this is in part a function of the reforms that have been put in place since the global financial crisis. It's been... Um, reassuring and seems necessary to have had the higher capital, 
the stronger liquidity standards, the stronger risk management standards. Um, of course, with the pandemic, we had a major economy-wide response. We had the Fed and the government putting in resources. But nonetheless, the banking sector was supportive of the efforts and didn't um, um, amplify some of the harder, the risk events that were happening. So I think, in general, the banking sector um, is, is showing itself as it should be and can be um, to be supporting the economy and supporting credit. I think we saw CCPs show a bit of resilience as well, although again, probably supported quite a bit by the efforts of the administration and, um, and the Federal Reserve. But they, you know, they raise margins, they reduce liquidity out of the markets. Um, we're seeing in the, in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine um, invasion, margins rise for uh, commodities. But in general, it is um, helping reduce the counterparty risk in the system. And so I think the reforms have been successful in that sense, um, supporting the resilience of these institutions. But there's, of course, always more that could be done. Um, as you said, the non-bank sector, we just looked through, we're just using these events, we've been evaluating the current macro prudential framework and the regulated sectors look like they perform well. We saw, of course, stresses in the money market funds again. We saw some stresses in the open end funds. We saw some um, lack of visibility and some leverage at some hedge funds, all of which are now parts of ongoing reform efforts um, by either the IAWG or FSOC. Um, so these are, these are important things, but the US financial system, I think, is in, has, has, has done well under this new framework. What are, uh, when you think about the macro prudential framework um, and, and the benefits that it, that it has conferred on the system and the economy, are there aspects of it that um, call for some reexamination based on some of the unintended uh, consequences or, or constraints or uh, uh, frictions you know, mm -hmm. that we saw over the last 24 months, for example? So I, let me just start with CCPs. I think some of the very high margin calls, intraday volatile calls. Of course, margins need to increase with volatility. Um, some of these appeared to be a little larger than expected, um, maybe forcing some stress. I think there's some room for improved governance, um, better, uh, better insight into the risk management models. Um, I think the idea of counter-cyclical margins should be or at least higher through the cycle margins should be examined. Um, so I think that's an area for further work. Um, the United States has not used the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Um, many other countries have. Many of them released those buffers the, as soon as the pandemic hit. Some have started to activate it again. So I think countries are showing that some of these counter-cyclical tools could be helpful. Um, the US has the stress tests which has a little bit of counter-cyclicality in it. Um, but I've done some work in the past with Don on this, and um, it doesn't quite get there. It's a little hard. Um, so there's some room to, um, to help there. One could imagine a counter-cyclical um, leverage ratio as well that could potentially be supportive of market liquidity in times of stress. So I think there are some um, potential you know, um, items to be looked at further on, on the margin. I don't want to say on the margin, but that's kind of what um, I think their supplemental could really help. But I think the core, the structural reforms to the banking and the CCPs have already put in place a, a resilient system. Uh, let me um, shift over to digital. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is an area where we're all spending an enormous amount of time. Um, but, but the, you know, the Treasury and the administration has approached this, uh, set forth uh, a set of uh, requirements through the executive order for responsible development of digital innovation. Uh, last week, the Treasury uh, solicited views about uh, the risks and opportunities presented by uh, this whole space. 
Can you talk a little bit more about the Treasury's approach right now? Sure. So um, let me start with um, digital assets. In some ways, it's kind of an extreme form of non-bank intermediation. I mean, it's set up to be to bypass the traditional financial intermediation. Um, I think what we've observed since last fall and the recent the decline of a couple trillion dollars of value, um, some of these assets, tokens, coins, um, are basically kind of high risk, high, high return, high risk investments. Um, and some may turn out not to have much value. I think consumer protection, investor protection, um, concerns that they abide by all BSA AML rules to, to uh, reduce the use for illicit finance are critical. And we put in RFI, one of the objectives of the presidential executive order is to look at the use cases for digital assets and do existing consumer investor protection rules and illicit finance rules address those risks. Um, I think actually more importantly though, the presidential EO looks at how do we think about the advantages um, of the new technology and the risks for a number of other areas? One is money and payments, which I think is critical. Um, another is um, national leadership, including democratic values. Um, so I think this is global economic competitiveness, um, the role of privacy, how to address those issues with the greater use of digital assets, and then more broadly, financial stability, which is separate from the investor and consumer protection. So one could think of how is leverage used in the system? Um, how is it connected to the more traditional financial system? There's a number of issues. So uh, Treasury is leading on five reports and consulting on a number of others, including like, it's, it's, a, it's a big homework assignment in some sense. Um, but um, future money and payments will be one of the very first. We'll be um, a working, Treasury is leading, but we'll be consulting with state and commerce and the national intelligence agencies. But um, digital assets has the potential to really fundamentally reform payments and um, even separate from the issue of CBDC, but just private uh, digital currency. Um, as you know, the PWG, the President's Working Group with the OCC and FDIC, issued a paper last fall, last November, on stable coins and the potential for that to become widely used for payments, not just for trading crypto assets, but to be used as a um, where the technology is used to facilitate transactions in the, in the real world. And we identified three risks. One is um, run risk, depending on the quality of the assets backing the stablecoin. Two is the operations and payment system risk. Um, if you have instantaneous settlement for stable coins, but treasury bills are settled T plus one, or you know, there's all these other operational issues. Those are really important. Um, the other issue is stable coins could scale up very quickly. I mean, if they're building on network effects, this is money. They're trying to function as money. And if you have um, firms that rely on you know, user data to facilitate, you could create walled gardens, you definitely want to be thinking about that. So those, that stable coin legislation proposal we put out last November. Um, we've been engaged with Congress quite a bit. Um, legislation is always hard, not wanting to put any odds of whether something would get passed, but Congress is engaged in the discussion. Um, and um, we did not think that current regulatory authorities were sufficient to address it, in part because the U.S. does not have a federal payments regulator. We have 49 state regulators and state money transmitter licenses potential. And so um, that complicates the regulatory environment. What, what is the, the scope for banks in all of this? Um, and, and you know, it's a, it's a area of significant uncertainty because it is relatively nascent. Um, and uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you believe to be the potential scope uh, for the, the, the institutions that are inside this you know, very traditional and very rigorous yeah. 
uh, parameter. Yeah. So I think there's the technology that could be adopted by banks for inter certainly for their internal use, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we know of examples where banks are using um, di distributed ledger technology, blockchain-based kind of technology to improve their internal systems. Um, I could imagine that banks could offer stable coins or um, some some version of like deposits that are like stable coins. So I think the goal of any legislation would be to allow both banks and non-banks to offer or new non-banks, you know, payment kind of entities to offer this service. I think, um, I think as you're thinking about this though, you wanna be thinking along the lines of what's happening to FedNow? How will FedNow, which it will be real time gross settlement, instantaneous settlement as well. How will that work alongside of this other technology? And maybe you want two technologies. Maybe having a, you know, some redundancy in our payment system isn't, is, could be beneficial. So I think there's plenty, I think banks are active. They're looking very closely. <laughs> um, they're also thinking about just not private digital assets, but the potential for central bank digital currency. Um, I think they, they play an active role, will continue. Um, let me ask you about uh, climate-related financial okay. risk. Yeah. Um, we, we're, we're, we're touching all of these big issues as a, in, the, in the course of a very tight agenda today, but, uh, but uh, only you can give us really the Treasury perspective today. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I wanna make sure that this is part of the focus. It's obviously something that is, um, uh, growing in terms of importance and attention and resource, certainly inside the institutions, particularly these very large institutions. Uh, so their uh, acquisition of technology, uh, information, modeling, you know, all these things are, again, relatively nascent, but, but getting a lot of intensive focus and resource. At the same time, the official sector is also gearing up and, and we've seen a lot of activity both here and of course um, on the other side of the Atlantic. What do you think is the emphasis now, um, particularly with respect to monitoring and, and, and managing uh, risk in the system associated with uh, weather? And, um, and, and then I guess more even specifically the use of scenario analysis and uh, how does the treasury not not a, not a regulator per se, how are you engaging and coordinating in that discussion and that work? Right. Um, so I highlight that um, Treasury's most direct work right now is through its ch being chair of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council issued a report last fall, also last fall. We did quite a bit of reports last fall um, on and identified climate change as an emerging threat to financial stability and took, had two points. One was financial institutions need to be able to manage their risks, need to be able to measure, monitor, and manage their risk. And two, the financial sector should help provide information necessary for investors to understand the risks of investments and better, to make better informed decisions. So I think there are two potential roles for the financial system. There's been quite a bit of work ongoing um, and um, creating a, some working groups where FSOC convenes the agencies. It's a shared learning place to share information on data, on risk metrics, how to think about scenario analysis. Um, you asked about scenario analysis. I think scenario analysis is like critical. It's a very consistent, um, constructive, disciplined way to focus on what do I need to understand risks? It's long-term, it's over a long horizon. You know, people have talked about whether there's interim targets than you know, 2030 instead of just 2050, hard to think. Um, the risks aren't in the data, so it's hard to measure them, um, but it's pretty important. So I think there's quite a bit of effort here. Now, scenario analysis is different than stress tests, as you know. It's not about capital implications. It's about trying to um, use it to identify the data you need and to construct alternative transition risk paths, which I think is necessary to address some of these risks. 
I just, I mentioned, I just came back from London. It was 70 degrees, it was beautiful for a week. And now this week, it's gonna be 105. And they're telling people not to get on the tube or the trains because the infrastructure may not man be able to manage that. So that like, those are, those are pretty difficult. That's, you know, I think we're just gonna see, could see more and more of that. And so the financial sector has a role. Um, I guess I, I always say this, the financial sector can't address climate change by itself. It's, it's a big part of the discussion. Um, but you do need a broad strategy, especially when you're thinking about transition risks. What is the broad strategy to get us to net zero? And so uh, there's, there's, it needs, it's a government approach, wide approach, um, and a private sector. It, it's not something the financial sector can take on its own, but it's really important that they contribute to this. Um, you commented on the, the current macro prudential framework um, and, and, and where we may need to take it or evaluate it and change it. Um, very specifically and related, um, we talked earlier this morning about issues around market making and market liquidity. Uh, obviously this was front and center during COVID, uh, some tremors even pre-COVID. Um, Treasury and other regulators issued a report last November on, on Treasury market liquidity and functioning. What kind of progress um, do you feel like we've made that you all have been able to make since that time? Yeah, so I actually, I think we've made quite a bit of progress. Um, so this was another one of the reports we issued last fall. Um, and this was under the IAWG, um, not PWG and not FSOC. But it is five, you know, it's Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board, New York Fed, SEC, and CFTC. Um, obviously, Treasury markets are the deepest, most liquid market in the world. We need to preserve its critical role. This is really important. I think technological advances, not blockchain, but other technological advances have, have changed the way Treasury markets function. Um, we have trading platforms. We have principal trading firms, we have different adjustments. So I think the uh, IAWG identified uh, five areas for further work. So one is where I mentioned um, on the demand for liquidity and stress periods. I mentioned open-end funds and hedge funds. Um, so there, the work at FSOC on that should help to try to alleviate sort of a surge in demand for liquidity and stress periods, which will you know, support treasury markets. But on the supply side, um, we have different kinds of dealers, you know, so are there, what's the role of principal trading firms? I mean, we saw that in 2014, um, their, you know, their, their provision of market liquidity is different than say dealers that take on, take on a more risk management capacity. Um, the trading platforms themselves, um, the treasury trading platforms have been exempt from most reg regulations because they're treasuries. Um, so the SEC has put out some proposed rules on both of those areas. They have also um, suggested that there needs to be more study of how to mandate central clearing for treasury and repo, which could um, maybe ease up some balance sheet constraints, and that's something of ongoing work. Um, transparency in the treasury market. So when March 2020, um, I was not at treasury then, I was at Brookings, and we were looking for, you know, trying to follow what is happening in the treasury market. And prices are available everywhere. But if you actually want to see quantities, um, it's very difficult. It's reported right now on a weekly basis and, um, and not with very much, you know, uh, detail. So there's been some work last week or two weeks ago, we put out an RFI for how to improve tra transparency in the treasury markets. Um, and um, with a goal of trying to provide more information to the market while at the same time preserving the ability of dealers to make markets without feeling, you know, at threat of, of their positions being, you know, um, revealed. Um, 
Banks have started to report their treasury securities to trace. So I think there, over time, there will be some uh, real improvement in that, I'm hoping. Um, so I think those are areas where we put out a lot of progress, we put, made a lot of progress. Rules and regulations take time. Um, it's not, these reforms will not like reduce volatility forever in the treasury market. It's just about trying to make them more resilient in those stress periods so that they can function and um, continue to, you know, serve as they're in their critical role in the financial system. Uh, and, and I guess one of the areas that hasn't perhaps seen as much um, concrete um, attention, uh, you know, in terms of proposed changes is the, the role of leverage capital yeah. Yeah. Uh, with respect yeah. to capacity and resiliency. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Group of 30 report you know, reminded us of that last yep. month, very yep. pointedly, frankly. Yep. Um, what What do you think about the role of leverage capital and, and, you know, what needs to be addressed and how soon it needs to be addressed? Yeah, so I think, um, well, I would say first, this the Federal Reserve said they would evaluate this. Um, I think with the change, you know, now that they've confirmed a position for soup and rag, they, I would imagine they would address this. I mentioned earlier, I think some of the capital rules probably have an effect on market making capacity. If you were to, um, a counter cyclical SLR could potentially have some benefits, um, potentially with a, so there are ways to sort of implement it. If we find that it has constraints, the counterfactual is gonna be hard. Like we can do research on this, but with the Fed purchasing such large amounts of treasuries in the moment for that period. They had to, um, it will be hard to see how binding the SLR and then the relaxation of the SLR was to support market liquidity. Nonetheless, of course, we should, we should look, um, but I think it's, uh, I think there's scope for further examination for sure. It seems inescapable that when you have that that huge volume of safe assets going into the system that you're 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 going to create um, unintended you know consequences with something that was intended to be a backstop versus you know a whatever a four stop yeah um, yeah is you know we we've thought a lot about this what is there a misalignment um, but you know between that part of the framework and the risk pace part of the framework how do you, how do we make sure we get that aligned correctly? Yeah, um, yeah. So I think um, I think that's been recognized. Nobody, I don't. The bank regulators do not want the leverage ratio to be the, you know, the first capital requirement. It is always meant to be a backstop. I think they adjusted the stress test to reflect that um, and remove the leverage ratio as one of the bogeys, the capital bogeys. I can't remember what the word. Um, and um, so I think there's a recognition of that. And if further adjustments need to be made, I imagine they would consider those. I mean. Um, so maybe just to wrap up, um, you, made a, you made a reference uh, earlier about uh, the, the role of the system and the oversight of the system and the importance of I would call it getting it right for purposes of making sure that our economy performs optimally mm -hmm. and that our, you know, our economy is competitive with the rest of the world and that the U.S. preserves its, you know, its proper role in so many different ways. Can you just, uh, you know, give us a sense of your, your, uh, your, how you think about, you know, the, the large regulated banking system here, how, how it is performing on behalf of the economy, not just here, but but overseas, whether it's in the context of uh, credit provision and capital markets, um, e you know, even uh, with respect to preserving not just the safety of the system from a financial standpoint, but its, you know, its role yeah. in exporting yeah. our values, um, our desire to keep illicit actors out, uh, uh, the, the ability of the United States to flex when it needs to, given some of these very unusual geopolitical events. Can you just riff a yeah, little bit about, yeah. uh, you know, about how, how you currently see things? Yeah. 
Um, so I think the banking sector has been very supportive of the economy. In the pandemic, I think they were able to continue to lend. They, they helped um, facilitate the funds out into the economy when needed. Um, I think that's played an important role. I actually think that what the banks did voluntarily, collectively, to scale back their share repurchases was really a good, was a good um, effort and suggested, you know, a neat, in light of like this very large shock, really, which is unprecedented and no one really knew. It was a good action to have taken. So I think that was useful. I think they've been extremely helpful with the sanctions. I mean, I thank all of them for all that they've done. Those are very complicated. Um, they're very complicated. And it's hard to implement, and it's been critical to the effort. Um, I think, and the US has been in a position of strength, relative, I think, relative the banking system relative to other countries that have been a little slower to implement all the reforms. A couple areas I would just, you know, would, would there's still a financial inclusion problem. Um, fees appear to be high. How to address some of the more vulnerable households and communities. Um, on climate risk, so one thing I, it, you know, one of the scenario analysis, one of the outcomes of the scenario analysis that I've um, has has stuck with me. So the Bank of England has done some exploratory analysis, and they've done banks and insurers. And one thing they can highlight is climate risks are going to raise the costs of some kinds of insurance or credit, and um, and one wants to think about the banks and insurance companies collectively, and are they leaving certain communities? or households in positions, really unvi you know, unviable financial positions. And how does one think about ex ante um, preparing for those, preparing for that and trying to help communities that are gonna have problems with this? I think this is an unavoidable thing, but those are what's on, that's part of, that's my pitch for the scenario analysis, but it's also for the macro pro approach, sort of the sort of look at the system collectively, how will that affect the economy? How will it affect certain communities? How will it affect the broader economy? Practical effects of the transition. Exactly. And so I think banks can really have a play an important role there and um, you know, be a little bit more preemptive in how they're approaching that issue. I think that would go a long way in terms of um, perception of the banks who I think have been doing a very strong and nice job of supporting the economy. In you know, in these times of uh, stress, much stress. So, so appreciate the uh, work by the institutions. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, and you've got uh, a lot of things to get back and do. So, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for for taking on this role to begin with. Okay. It's a big job on top of a big job that you left, and so we're grateful for for everything that you're bringing to it and bring to the country. So thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for having me.